Well, welcome back everyone and welcome to our final panel of the day. Thank you so much for making it this far because uh, really looking forward to this chat on mental health matters and you matter. Um, as someone who's personally struggled with depression and anxiety over the years and continues to struggle with them on and off, uh, I'm just in awe of our student athletes and how they have and continue to share their stories about their mental health struggles and their victories, um, especially the past few years. Uh, as the NCAA's chief medical officer, Dr. Brian Hainline said, in doing so, in sharing those stories, um, our student athletes aren't just telling their stories, they're actually changing the world. And I couldn't agree more. Um, as we all know, so many young people look up to our student athletes. Our student athletes motivate and influence and impact each other. Uh, so today on Together We Rise Day here in the NCAA, we're so looking forward to continuing this conversation. Joining us for this important conversation today on mental health. She's the section chief of sports medicine at Arizona State, an adjunct instructor in medicine at the College of Medicine at the Mayo Clinic. And all of this comes after a very successful four-year career as a gymnast at the University of Minnesota, Dr. Shannon Lancaster. She was a two-time first-team All-American, a two-time Pac-12 Player of the Year during her tenure at UCLA. And she's now, well, she's now sporting the red, white, and blue. She's training for now next summer's Olympics She's a phenomenal pitcher and hitter. She did it all. She continues to do it all. She is UCLA alum, Allie Carta. Dr. Lancaster, Allie, thanks so much for being with us here today. Thank you for having us. Uh, thank you. So Dr. Lancaster, let's start with you um, because in addition to overseeing all the aspects of student athlete health down at Arizona State, working for the Mayo Clinic as well. That wasn't enough for you. You're also chair of our mental health task force here in the Pac-12, uh, where I know student voices really do guide your work. I know in the early stages of the pandemic, uh, the NCAA asked student athletes across the country and got over 16,000 responses. Um, just the question, how are you doing right now as, as this pandemic uh, gets well, started after all these months? And the majority said that they were struggling with their mental health. Um, so what more can you share with us, Dr. Lancaster, from that study? Yeah, that was a, a great study and, and got great responses. Like you said, they got over 16,000 Division One student athletes to respond, which is fantastic. And the, the horrible thing, though, is that the majority of respondents really reported that they're experiencing high rates of mental distress. More than a third were experiencing sleep difficulties, and one in 12 reported being so depressed that it was hard for them to function. So it's, that's a staggering number. Yeah. Um, even, even more scary from that is that... At, during the shelter at home, many athletes were displaced from you know, their current medical home on campus. Mm -hmm. And while 80% said that they knew how to access medical care where they were at, between 55 and 60% said they knew how to access mental health resources. So in a time where there was more stress, more uncertainty, um, our, our student athletes didn't know where to turn. The other thing that the study actually showed was that student athletes look to their coaches. So it's a big responsibility on coaches and, and support staff to be able to provide those resources and know the next steps and you know what's the, the emergency action plan for campuses if there is someone that's in distress. Mm -hmm. Well, Allie, uh, that sets us up perfectly, um, what Dr. Lancaster just shared, because you've lived it, um, obviously not in the midst of a global pandemic, right? But But I know that there was things that Dr. Lancaster just mentioned that I'm sure resonated with you. So take us back. I know it hasn't been that long since you were a superstar down in Westwood. What was your journey like um, during your days at UCLA? I mean, I had an amazing time at UCLA. I think um, it was an honor just to be able to go to school there. Um, but looking back now, I think I have such a more clarity about, you know, mental health and it's so huge in our world right now. And um, there's so many resources. Um, unfortunately for me, to be honest, I was a stubborn athlete. And I think a lot of people are now and you just want to have that like go getter and, and competitive toughness about you. Um, and I was the same way going into college. And while I was there, I, um, I didn't want to be looked at as weak. And I didn't want my coaches to know, you know, that I was struggling. Um, mm -hmm. I thought maybe it was going to impact if I was going to get on the field or how people looked at me. And I, I just wanted to be looked at as that tough athlete. So um, 
for me, and if I were to tell anyone watching who might just kind of be, in, you know, being stubborn about going and talking to someone, um, whether it's professional help or whether it's your coach, you know, like you talked about, the coaches have such a positive impact on us. So um, I would just encourage people to go and talk to someone. Um, and again, it doesn't have to be professional help, but just someone that you can go to, because I think um, I did that a little too late. I think for my mental health journey, I waited and it just builds and builds and builds and it gets worse. And um, it's, it's okay to go and talk to people and ask for help. And, um, you know, we are all struggling in our own ways. So similar to you, I, I struggle a lot with anxiety um, and in college, same way. Um, but again, I just, I let it build and I put it off and um, not until recently was I able to finally ask for help. So um, I just encourage people to go and, and reach out to someone on campus or your coach or someone close to you that you're able to just kind of talk it through with. I, I think you hit on so many things that so many of us who, who deal with or are in the process of it right now or wonder if they're dealing with depression or anxiety, Allie. Um, it's, it's the athlete mentality of, right? Like, I should be able to conquer this on my own. I've been able to overcome everything else, whether it was a torn ACL, whether it was a big loss that I bounced back from, taught to be invincible and, and to handle your problems and push through them. And I've talked to so many student athletes like you who, who didn't, didn't almost know how to ask for help because that had been the mentality that they had been taught for so long. So you said it was just kind of recently. What, what was it that finally gave you the okay within yourself to say, you know what, I am a superstar, but in this instance, I'm realizing that I, I maybe need to ask somebody or at least talk to somebody for a little while to see if I can get some help. Right. I mean, I think one, I, unfortunately, I think I just let it get to that point, you know, where you're just like, I can't do, I can't live how I'm living. And I, I want, you know, more clarity and happiness. And just, I want a better life right now for myself as a person and as an athlete. So I think I just got to that point. Um, but I think I also, I, I just going into being an Olympic athlete, you know, we, we train our bodies to be the best athlete we can be. And I think I finally just realized um, you know, you have to train your mind that way too. And, and not only the, the mental toughness side on the mental part of your game, but just the mental side of your, your well being and your happiness and how you feel internally. Um, so I think if we don't, you know, we work on all those things, you go to the gym and you train and you go, you know, to the field, to the court, whatever you do, and you put in those extra hours. Um, and, and we should be able to put in those extra hours, making our mind feel the same way. So I think I, it finally just clicked for me. Um, and I know we're probably going to get into some strategies, but, um, I think making it more of a lifestyle with, you know, mindfulness and meditation and those strategies that we're going to talk about, I, I fully 100% bought into um, and just made it more of a lifestyle rather than, you know, okay, I'm feeling, I'm not feeling great today. Let me try and go practice something and, and you know, maybe do a meditation here or there. Mm -hmm. um, it's the same with, with our sport. If you only do it every once in a while, you know, you're going to get, you're going to get out of it what you put in it. So I finally just made that a priority um, and kind of put my mind and my well being first. Wow, great. And and as you mentioned, we will definitely get into those strategies in a moment. Before we get there, I want to get back to something Dr. Lancaster said, and you mentioned as well, Allie, um, about the coaches, Dr. Lancaster, because in addition to obviously interacting with a lot of our student athletes, I have really close contact with a lot of our coaches across all of our sports. And that has been one of the things that has just blown all of them away that in the past, even five, six years ago, they had to be an expert on their sport. And that was pretty much what was asked of them, right? In addition to the recruiting and some other things, but now they really need to be aware of at least how to recognize signs, how to, how to point student athletes to resources, what the resources they have available on campus are and so much more. And I know for a lot of them, that's been overwhelming. They, they want to do it and they want to learn, but, but it's been a lot. So just down at Arizona State, obviously, since that's your school of expertise, what have you seen from the coaches at ASU? There's been a, a tremendous willingness from the coaches to really help collaborate. You know, we know it's going to take a village to help conquer this epidemic of, of mental health, and it requires really recognition. It requires uh, pushing people through the 
mental health emergency action plan. So we have emergency action plans for everything else in life, right? If there's a fire, um, if there's a cervical spine injury, if there's something else. And really what the PAC-12 has done a really fantastic job with is making sure that campuses also have an emergency action plan for mental health. So knowing those resources, knowing the, the resources both on campus and within the community, and then promoting access to care. So again, I think sometimes as a student, there's this stigma that's associated with mental health and you don't want your coach to not think you're tough. Um, you, so you tend to internalize a lot of those emotions. And we know that early care um, really can, can improve outcomes. Um, so making sure that access is promoted, name and normalizing emotions, knowing that every athlete is gonna go through a range of experiences different thoughts, different emotional responses, mm -hmm. and naming, normalizing, and just making sure that people understand that what they're going through is, it's just part of the journey. And they don't have to be alone. They don't need to isolate. Um, lots of resources available. And so getting them connected to those resources on campus. So talk to us about some of the resources that you have down in Tempe, because that's a question I get asked a lot from either prospective student athletes or from parents. Um, just, you know, what, what are the resources that we're pointing our student athletes to these days? Yeah, I think one of the, the big things that we've instituted recently over the last couple of years is just generalized screening for all of our student athletes. Um, so we're checking in with them in a really formal basis in the physician's office um, in a way that, you know, sometimes I joke with athletes, this is your own little Vegas. What happens here stays here. And so we can have these conversations in a really safe way. Mm -hmm. um, and, and starting those conversations and saying, hey, you know, it's okay to feel anxious. It's okay to feel sad sometimes, to feel stressed out. And let's talk about how, how to overcome those emotions and get you performing your best both in the classroom and on the field. Um, and so we utilize our campus counseling services here. We have a sports medicine advisory team that helps out as well if we need additional services in the community. Um, and I think we've got a, a pretty good process down now, Allie, I know obviously you're training for the Olympics. Can't wait to see softball back in the Olympics um, next summer. Um, but you're also, even though you haven't transitioned all the way there yet, you're coaching up our student athletes here in the Pac-12, especially when it comes to normalizing, talking about and taking care of one's mental health. So interested, how did that come together and what has that work meant to you? I think um, just in, like I said, the recent years, it's just, it's personal to me. So I know I've gone through it and worked through it. And I think just in the, the last maybe year or so, um, it's kind of just started to come together for me. So I think in the moment where it did, and I started to practice these things and become more aware of mental health and aware of just myself in general, I think um, it was kind of turned into a, more of a passion too, which is cool. And I think for a lot of student athletes, you know, we get asked, what, what do you want to do? I'm like, for the longest time, I have no idea. And, you know, I still may not know. I'm still playing softball and, and doing that. But um, it turned into more of like, okay, I, I'm really passionate about this. And I, I enjoy talking about it. And I enjoy trying to connect with someone, you know, whether I'm talking to a team and I, I connect maybe just with one or two people about my story and, and maybe they're, they're feeling the same kind of way. Um, so just those small moments of, I've seen that it's helped me. I want to try and connect and help as many people as I can if they're struggling, because I know a lot of us are the same. And, and like I said, we don't, we don't talk about it. Um, so when we're able to, and we're able to kind of connect with each other, um, I just have found kind of a new um, passion with that. And so um, I'm trying to build off it and, and do what I can and speak about it as many times as I can. So this webinar is amazing that we're able to, to do that. So um, again, it just kind of became more of a passion for me in the last year. Well, and as I mentioned right off the top, it's so important because I've already talked to student athletes who are still on the conference who, you know, look up to Allie Carter because hopefully she's going to be winning a gold medal next summer. Um, and, and for her to be as open and for you, Allie, to be as open, it's every single time you talk, it, it makes a difference. Okay, you already mentioned some of um, the mechanisms that you're using to help yourself, meditation and other things. So would love for you to share more of those and maybe how you came across them. And maybe if there's some things that you tried, but they didn't work for you, because I think that's an important part of this conversation as well. There's not there's not a one fits all uh, meditation app or medicine or anything like that. And it's important for, for folks to know that they should explore. And that's a part of the process. Definitely. Um, 
I think um, for me, one, like I said, be, making that mindfulness and meditation more of a lifestyle, I think is so important when, whenever you do any of this um, and whether maybe it's the same as medication, once you do find something that works, continue to do it. Even if you are feeling better and feel good and it's working, um, I think sometimes we stop doing it um, and, and just go back to it maybe when we're struggling again. So whatever you do find, um, just continue to do it um, and make it more of a lifestyle is what has really helped me. Um, in addition to the, the meditation, I have fully 100% tried to just control my nutrition and sleep as much as possible. I know um, as a college athlete, that's hard. Um, I struggled with it too a little bit. I, I'm, I'm always one that tries to, to eat well and exercise and, and I love that part, um, but it gets hard, right? And especially during our schedules and traveling and, and all of it gets really tough, but um, just fueling our body to perform and have the energy is, is really important. And then um, with sleep, not only getting the right amount of sleep, but I think that's what's helped me is just creating a, a good like nightly routine that you're able to calm yourself down before you get to sleep. I think, you know, we're on our phones a lot of the times mm -hmm. or you're watching TV or you're, you know, up doing something. Um, so just trying to maybe 30 minutes before you go to bed, try and create that that routine for yourself. And then um, with not only the, the nightly routine, but just creating some kind of routine for yourself during the day. Um, I think for me, um, I have learned that I need that routine. I know some people may not, they're a little bit more um, spontaneous and that works for them. But I think at least giving yourself, um, you know, a list of the things you know you have to get done um, and putting those first. And then what's really helped me during the pandemic, especially, is to try and just find one thing to look forward to during the day um, or putting something in your routine that you really enjoy. Um, so I think we have a routine and, and that might keep us on track, but it gets kind of you know, mundane after a while, or you're just kind of going through the motions. So um, I really try and, you know, whether it's just what I'm going to cook for breakfast the next morning, or maybe I have, you know, a coffee date with a friend, or, you know, I get to go watch the sunset or whatever it is, but giving yourself just some one small thing every day to look forward to. So you have that, um, you know, positive thing amongst your, your crazy schedule of a day. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Lancaster, just want to allow you the opportunity to add on to anything that Allie just said there. Yeah, you know, I think she has a lot of great, great tips there. Um, and, and I think just really echoing that um, there isn't one thing that's going to work for everyone. And so a lot of these techniques are fantastic. And, and even talking to, to friends and teammates and parents, they might say, hey, you got to try this, you got to do this. Um, you know, and so I think having an open mind about all those different things. Um, but I love like your practice of gratitude of like the, what you're looking forward to. I think that's fantastic. Um, and, and again, I think also reaching out and knowing that what's going on with you is not unusual during this time period. Mm -hmm. um, the, the American Psychiatric Association actually just last week published a study that 62% of Americans are feeling more anxious than they were this time last year. Mm -hmm. um, so that we're, we're all kind of in this together, you know, and I think even during this time of physical distancing, we don't necessarily need to socially distance. Those connections are important. So continue working and building those and figuring out how to support each other. Yeah, I, I still remember um, when I was in a really dark period a number of years ago, literally a, a one sentence text from a friend saying, hey, Kate, I'm thinking about you. Keep hanging in there. It sounds really, really small, but it, it made a big difference for me at the time. Um, but Speaking of phones, right? Allie brought it up. Like, try to put it away a half hour before bedtime. I know that is a huge part of this conversation, Dr. Lancaster. Um, so anything that you can share with us about the impact of phones and social media and how we can, <laughs> if we need to, create a little distance between those two things? Yeah, sometimes actually taking a little vacation from social media is just what the doctor ordered. <laughs> um, you know, it's just, it's it's a lot of pressure. And, and it's something that I don't envy uh, student athletes today, because not only do they have their own 
emotions and those of their loved ones, but then they're getting people weighing in on Twitter accounts from thousands of miles away. Um, sometimes it can be hard to separate that stuff and realize that, you know what, that's an, a really excited fan and, you know, they're disappointed because of, of what happened um, or a mean fan from the other team that is disappointed about what happened. Um, and so sometimes it can be really hard, but I think separating that stuff and, and actually having some scheduled time away from your phone can be a great um, resource as well. Just, just to try to separate that time, you know, maybe it's, you need to spend some time journaling, um, or just, you know, meditation or some other quiet time with yourself. Um, mm -hmm. but it can just help to unplug from the hectic pace of the world. Yeah. And I know that it's so hard right now. Okay. You two have already given us a, a number of great takeaways, but if there's one or two more things that somebody can grab at the end of our little chat here, um, what are a couple of, of things that you would love to leave our audience with today? Um, Allie, I'll start with you. Yeah, I think um, maybe just one thing on how we talked about, you know, what works for you may not work for someone else. I think um, kind of where you get your energy from is the same kind of way. I think just encouraging people to really kind of dive into to what works for them and becoming a little bit more self-aware. Um, I know that has, has helped me. So, um, you know, we talked about how you recharge or, um, you know, what what gives you your energy. I think if you know, maybe if you do like that alone time, and, and for me, I'm, I'm that way, you know, I'd rather journal or meditate or, you know, do the actual self-care kind of night by myself. Um, that gives me my energy and I, I'm able to recharge and, and, and get back that way. Um, but know what works for you. Maybe you're more extroverted and, and you would rather, you know, talk to your friends and, you know, go on an adventure or whatever that might be. Maybe that gives you energy. Um, but I think just really understanding what you need and not comparing what you need if it's better or worse than what someone else is doing. Um, mm -hmm. The comparison and, and looking at what everyone else is doing um, is, uh, it's just, it eats at you. So mm -hmm. um, just worry about you, focus on what you need um, first and just put, put your priorities and your energy first before um, kind of giving your energy to other people is, is my biggest thing that I've learned. Yeah, really great takeaway. Dr. Lancaster, what about you? You know, I think my takeaway would be to know who your campus resources are. Who who are who is your support? Um, all the way from peers, friends, teammates, coaches to professional resources as well. Um, the Pac-12 has done a great job. Every every campus has identified licensed mental health professionals who are there to to help. You know, and and in this very hectic world, to just spreading spreading compassion increasing sensitivity to what others are going through um and in, in this time where there's so much uncertainty just being being a, a, a steady friend and, and being a steady hand for those who are around you yeah i love that thank you dr lancaster thank you Allie. thank you both um and stay where you are because we're gonna have questions in just a couple of minutes but Kind of going with the theme of what's going on throughout today and um, throughout this conference. She was supposed to be with us for this conversation, but due to the red flag warnings we've had here in California this week, Dr. Sahar Youssef, um, part of the power outages in the Bay Area and doesn't have access to, to internet right now. Um, but luckily, just a few minutes after this conversation, she was able to get on board and has put together a wonderful presentation for us. So we will be back for questions in just a few minutes, but first a, a presentation from UC Berkeley's Dr. Sahar Youssef. Thank you so much, Kate. Uh, this has been quite a roller coaster. And just to echo so much of this conversation, resilience this year is just full of so many interesting hurdles for all of us, but I'm so excited to be able to join you all now. Um, so I'll jump in and try to, I've tried to squeeze in as much information uh, and tips and tricks as I could uh, in a short amount of time so that we can really have as much time as possible for questions. But I'll go ahead and jump in. And I really wanted today's uh, piece that I'm able to share uh, really as a non-student athlete, but as a faculty member uh, and as a coach that has worked with many student athletes over the year to, years, if I were to distill down in this time in 2020, what are the three biggest mistakes I see our student athletes making and just folks across the board, myself included, biologically motivated to make these mistakes because these are gonna be natural tendencies. What are they? Why are we compelled to make them? And what should we do instead? So that's what I'm, what I'm going to jump into uh, today. 
Mistake number one is actually poor hygiene. And I assure you, I am not going to launch in to a tutorial on how to wash your hands properly during this pandemic. Um, I'm actually just going to be talking about what I call environmental and digital hygiene, which again, um, everything that uh, Ali, uh, Kate, uh, Dr. Lancaster, everyone was talking about with phones. Um, I'm going to be harping on that just a little bit again, just as a good reminder, but poor hygiene. Now the biological principle at play behind this mistake is that human beings are hardwired, so to speak, from a cognitive neuroscientific standpoint to constantly scan their environment for lions, tigers, and bears, anything that might be emotionally salient. You cannot help but constantly scan your environment. Briefly, just talking about the real estate in the human brain, you have the occipital cortex here in the very back of the head and the temporal cortex right over here. Both of these brain areas combined make up upwards of 40% of the real estate in the human brain. And these brain areas are responsible for visual processing and auditory processing. You cannot help this. This is just how we are operating and how we are built. That means even if you feel like you've got your head 100% in the game, you're present with your body in a moment, you are present with schoolwork, you're present with a loved one, there is still a background processing happening, which it ought to. Again, it goes back to the fact that human beings are not that competitive in the animal kingdom. I know we all like to think we're invincible super people and we're super strong and we are, but truly if a lion, tiger or a bear were to walk in, we would not be able to fight off that threat. So human beings have evolved to constantly be scanning, uh, just listening and watching for anything that might be an opportunity or a potential, potential threat. So having said this, what are the takeaways? What should we be doing? Because anything you might be seeing, even right now as you're listening to this, is your phone out in front of you? Do you see folks walking by? What kind of background noise are you hearing? I'll start with visual and then move into auditory. Think about what you can do when you're sitting down to do schoolwork, just so you can get it done efficiently so that you're not draining that energy and those cognitive resources throughout the day. Think about what you can do to potentially create uh, a um, visual barrier, turning towards a window or a wall, just away from foot traffic, not sitting in the center of the room, especially you know with roommates, whatever it may be walking around, it is going to be a big distraction. Now, next, I think an often underutilized technique, which I'm excited to share with you all today, is actually to close your eyes when you can, even for a minimum of 10 seconds. If you close your eyes for a minimum of 10 seconds, we see a massive spike in alpha waves in the brain. And this is a marker of restfulness. If you can take even a bathroom break's worth of time, just take 10 seconds and close your eyes. You will feel an immediate energy dam effect with your body, with your mind. It grounds you immediately. If you're on a lot of Zoom calls, another uh, quick tip is to ignore self view. It is not biologically natural for us to see ourselves when we are trying to be 100% on and focused either on schoolwork or when you're practicing. Okay. It is as if just imagine a, a theoretical, uh, you know, a situation where you would drag in a mirror or a pocket mirror while you're sitting there having a meeting with someone or you're on a date or trying to have a meaningful conversation. But while you're trying to focus on the other person, you can see you constantly. That's really what Zoom, WebEx, all of our different video conferencing tools, most of the time they have a self view. Get it out of the way. If you use Zoom, there's a three ellipses button where you can click that and it says hide self view, but you can grab a post it and just cover it up wherever you are in the view screen. But it makes a massive difference for stress levels and energy levels throughout the course of the day. Now moving into auditory. Okay, you're constantly listening to anything going on in the background, you cannot help it. Again, noise canceling headphones are of course going to be the holy grail here, are the gold standard, but they're not absolutely necessary. I use just normal everyday headphones. The idea here is to try to block background noise from getting processed. So anything you can do, even earplugs are phenomenal. Now, if you'd like to have an added benefit of drowning out other people in the background, then you can opt to listen to music or white noise. But if you do like listening to music, make sure you opt to listen with music with no lyrics at all, or lyrics in a language that you don't under understand. And the reason is that the human brain, again, if you understand the language that's being spoken, you're going to background process it and it will make, it'll take away from your resources. So literally you'll be measurably dumber if you can hear stuff in the background or you see folks walking by. So do what you can to protect these sensory systems, okay? Now, for the biggest drain of our cognitive resources throughout the course of the day, and that is the modern day smartphone, okay? I'm gonna share a really frightening study that came out of UT Austin a few years ago. In this particular study, they took a large sample of healthy 
high performing young adults and they had them take a battery of cognitive assessments. These are things that I do in my lab as well. They tested their memory. They tested their attention and focus ability. They tested also their general fluid intelligence. It's huge. Across the board, they tested all of these different things into, in two different conditions. One, where everyone's stuff was outside in the waiting room while they were doing their, the, the battery of cognitive assessments. And the second version was they were allowed to have their phone in the room, but they were asked to power it completely down. So the phone is dead, it is off. No notifications, no calls, no dings, no buzzes, nothing. Nothing is coming through, but across the board, every single assessment they had these folks do, their scores were significantly lower when the phone was in the room with them. Again, a dead phone. It is as stimulating as a cup of coffee or my clicker. It's just sitting there face down on the table. But if you can see your phone right now during this present, during this conference, if you can see your phone, if it's in your visual field, your brain cannot help but background process it. You are measurably less uh, productive, but also lower performing. Okay, memory, attention, general fluid intelligence, all impacted with the cell phone being present. So echoing what everyone else was saying earlier, it's, it's social media. Yes, absolutely. We know it's, it's harmful. We know the notifications are just constantly draining the energy and the blood glucose in your brain. They're making you measurably more exhausted at the end of the day, and they're taking away from your performance. But it also turns out just the presence of it, even if it's dead and not distracting you, it's still cognitively draining. Think about what you can do to create separation. Put it in a shelf, put it in the drawer, put it in a bag, out of sight, out of mind, when you want to be 100%. When you want to be 100%, the phone can't be around. Mistake number two is excessive task switching. I have to announce something. We cannot multitask. It is not real. It is a myth, okay? The biological principle at play here is that every single time you switch contexts, you're thinking about your game, you're thinking about what you need to be doing, your practice, and then you jump into whatever it may be. Uh, it could be um, homework that you have, deadlines that you have, all of that. You are measurably actually losing energy and time. Every single time you switch, there is something called a switch cost. You pay for it. You pay for it in energy and you pay for it in time. Instead of switching, allowing yourself to jump into your email, look at your phone, check social media, jump back into homework, do this and that. Instead of that, monotask. Intentionally sit down and get serious. Just like we wouldn't in the middle of a game say, oh, I need to check Instagram really quick. You shouldn't do it while you're doing homework either. Allow yourself the opportunity to intentionally sit down, focus, so that you're using the least amount of energy on your schoolwork, the least amount. The idea is to create an energy dam here. Finish it, finish one thing, and then move on so that you can minimize the switch cost. Mistake number three is constant expenditure, okay? The hours of the day are not equal. We are biological beings, we are not machines. Myself at 9 a.m. is not the same at 9 p.m. From a glucocorticoid perspective, where we're talking about stress hormones in the body that keep us alert and aroused, but also thinking about everything from dopamine to acetylcholine, our bodies and our brains are not operating the same throughout the course of the day. Every human being has what is called a biological chronotype. It is genetically determined and it does not change. You can get it to shift by two to three hours, but everyone has a chronotype and it does not change. There are three core types. AM shifted and PM shifted are rather obvious. These are morning birds, folks that wake up bright-eyed and bushy-tailed and linearly decrease in energy throughout the course of the day. And then you have the min genetic minority of the human population. You have PM shifted folks like myself, where you increase in energy as the day progresses. I increase in my, my glucocorticoids, my stress hormones that keep me active. I increase as the day progresses. And then you have the vast majority of the human population, okay? Over 50% of people are actually biphasic. That means you have two core energy peaks and one core trough in the middle of the day. So if you're the kind of person that has that afternoon slump, this is likely you. Now, why am I bringing this up? You need to know your energy profile. You need to know when it's optimal for you to wake up and go to sleep every night. At least knowing it allows you to go in to your life, your routine with your body, with your mind and be strategic. Know when your mind is at its best, okay? If you're PM shifted, it's gonna be later in the day. Don't try to hit your head against the wall trying to get your most important work done at 8 a.m., okay? See when, it's not gonna be every day. It's not going to be every day, but when you can, when you can schedule around your chronotype, okay? If you're wondering what your chronotype might be, um, we've collaborated with folks over at mychronotype.com to get you all uh, a free access code to avoid the paywall. You just put in the code PAC12 and you can get your personalized results uh, in your inbox. It's a short uh, five-minute survey. Alrighty. Now, quick summary, and then I'm excited to see your questions. One, 
clean up your digital hygiene. It will make a big difference. Phone out of sight, out of mind. Notifications should be off. Do not check the news and do not check every single application 15 million times a day. Treat your brain. You're an Olympic athlete as well from the neck up. This is important. If you don't control the mind, you can't control the body. Okay. You have to turn the notifications off. And if you've never tried this before, go into grayscale, go into your settings and embrace grayscale. Evil people like me have made this phone as addictive as possible. And everything about the light that's emitted from the screen and the color saturation, even from the icons is actually optimized to keep your eyes wanting to keep staring at the screen. So take some control back for your own mind and for your body and go into grayscale so that the phone seems immediately less stimulating. Two, monotask and focus, okay? Do everything you can to block out distracting background noise by listening to music with either no lyrics or lyrics in a language you don't understand, okay? I listen to pretty obnoxious Swedish and German techno music. It keeps my energy high, but I don't understand those languages. So you bypass uh, the energy drain there and leverage your chronotype. Know when you're at your best, be strategic and deploy yourself uh, as you see fit. Now, uh, last slide, and then we can jump into questions here, but just a, a quick reminder is mychronotype.com, use the code PAC12. Uh, and if you like this kind of research and, and research that's geared towards either student athletes or just productivity and high performance, you're more than welcome to sign up for a once a month newsletter where we deploy new research uh, and send out new research that uh, we're working on at becomingsuperhuman.science. All right, and with that, hopefully we can jump in and take a peek at some questions. I'm seeing here a question coming in about caffeine, uh, great as a performance enhancer. So caffeine uh, does work in fact, in terms of energy uh, throughout the course of the day, but you need to know something, drinking coffee first thing in the morning is completely useless. And it ends up over time making you more and more dependent on caffeine as a performance enhancer. And you'll have to continue to uh, drink more and more of it as time progresses. So what I recommend is actually having caffeine, uh, ideally, especially if you're biphasic, at 10 a.m. and 2 p.m. to really start to mitigate and address those natural energy dips that we have around lunchtime and after lunchtime. So that's going to be the ideal time if you do have tea or, or coffee to have it then. Dr. Youssef, it's so great to see you. I know, it's so great to see you we all too. It. Go Bears. I know. I was okay. a part of the power adages earlier this week as well, and that was do you have any suggestions for what to do when that happens? <laughs> oh my goodness. I know. Thank you all for being so patient with me. I was, I was losing hope there for a minute. So we had the power outages and then my neighbor's uh, generator blew up. So that was fun. Oh, so we had no. to get evacuated. Yeah, it was quite an interesting week. I mean, with a power outage, there's really only one thing you can do is use it as an opportunity. I mean, that's really been the anthem of this year, has it not? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, with, with so many sports winding down, it's like, you know what? You got to roll with the punches instead of sitting there and saying everything is you know, ruined and now I can't do anything, mm -hmm. ask yourself, huh, what is always harder to do when the Wi-Fi is, uh, you know, accessible, when the mm -hmm. TV's there, when I can, you know, have all this stimulation, what am I usually avoiding and procrastinating on? And now's the time to just do that. What textbook have you been avoiding? What, you know, cleaning out your closet? And then you'll notice the power outage, you know, it's done and you've organized everything. You've you got your whole life in order, to-do list updated. Well, it's like the world heard the presentation you just gave, like put your phone away, I'm gonna do it for you, right? Dr. Lancaster, Allie, it's great to see you again as well. Um, so I wanna dive into more questions because people have had enough of me talking today. Um, Allie, next question is for you. Um, as a former student athlete and current Team USA Olympic softball team member, uh, you're a role model for young people everywhere. What can we do to model good mental health behavior for the next generation? generation to normalize thinking about it, talking about it, making daily changes to focus on it? That's a great question. I, and I maybe don't have a specific answer, but I would say that for me, I've been trying to just live my life and show in moments where I'm struggling, just show courage. And I've been trying to live by that word and, and with that word every day um, at the forefront, because we're all gonna struggle with things. Everything is not always gonna go our way, whether you're an athlete or not, we all have our own um, mental health struggles. But I think when we try and you know, avoid it or don't face it um, and, and just, you know, we, we go down a different road rather than 
just accepting, you know, I am struggling and being vulnerable and being open with saying it, it's okay. You know, I, I'm struggling right now and I do need help. I think if we show that behavior um, instead of always showing the mental tough behavior and, and just avoiding our feelings, um, I think if we're able to be more open about it um, with more people, then they'll also feel comfortable being open as well. Yeah, I think so, definitely. Uh, Dr. Lancaster, anything you'd like to add? I, I know we breezed over it at the start, but I mean, you were a four-year varsity gymnast at Minnesota, so I'm sure you experienced a ton of stuff that you now use in your work today. Yeah, you know, I, I think the best thing that, that we're seeing is that people are talking about it um, and naming and normalizing emotions. Even, you know, as I do pre-participation physicals for our incomers, um, just seeing the, the number of people that are saying, yep, I've seen a counselor in the past and this is what we've talked about, or I struggle with depression and anxiety um, and, and being okay with that, I think. And, and, but also knowing that it's okay not to be okay. And just being able to push that and, and as, as a culture within sports to say, you know what, there are going to be days that you struggle and that's okay. Let's talk about it. Dr. Youssef, anything you'd like to add? I mean, that I, I just echo all of that. Uh, again, I love the idea of um, embracing and normalizing the fact that, again, we're not machines. We're not super people. Mm -hmm. And I say that because I teach a class on called Becoming Superhuman. I was going to say, wait a second. <laughs> well, the, the twist uh, that I'll share with you all is that first day of class, people come in and they're like, oh, we're so excited to be superhuman and like peak performing and all of this. And I go, great. Step one is be human. <laughs> that's how you become see, that's a secret is you have to embrace the fact that this thing is a is a squishy you know piece of you know uh, equipment and it's not a machine we're mm -hmm. humans and humans require a diff different operating manual we do have feelings we do burn out um we need to be fueled differently you know uh we do need rest all mm -hmm. of these different things and if the more you fight against it um you know the less uh performing we'd be in, in the first place yeah definitely um another question for for our doctors and Ali, you can feel free to weigh in as well. Um, there seems to be very little light at the end of the tunnel to get to the other side of this pandemic right now. Um, trying to stay positive day in and day out is work. Are there any strategies based on what we're living through right now that you would recommend? Did, Dr. Did, you, did you wanna go ahead? Well, I, I think one thing that Ali you know, reported on was, was finding those little things each day um, that you can look forward to or that you're grateful for. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think it's it's always it's always a great reminder that, you know, when you actually take a moment to take a big deep breath and look around you, you know what, when, you're, when your power is shut, shut off, it's because you are fortunate to have power, to live someplace that has power. There are, are many people that are homeless and, and don't have that, that privilege. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes it, in the busyness of the world and, and we get caught up in our day-to-day -day lives, that you forget about all of the great things that surround you. So it's it's that you know quintessential trait thing that you know stop and smell the roses once in a while, mm -hmm. see the beautiful views and the beautiful sunsets and the wonderful people that surround you, and appreciate. Yeah, it's a wonderful reminder. I love that. Um, I I would only chime in and add. Um, an exercise I typically recommend to my students when going through either grief or great trauma or st stress, and that's uh, an exercise called perspective taking. Uh, and what I typically walk folks through or, or ask you to do visualize on your own is to take a few minutes every single day and really embrace and visualize how small our issues are and how small we are in the grander scheme of things. Mm -hmm. So how you do perspective taking is really doing it time and space. If it helps for you to really think about all of the generations that have lived through X, Y, and Z, and how 2020 and this moment in time is so small, and how unlikely we even are in 100 years to look back and have this be significant. So it can either be time-based or it can even be space, which you know can be quite uh, expansive, but truly sitting and, and actually thinking about how small our Earth is and how large our universe is and how many stars we have and how many galaxies there are. And it starts to make you know, the small things that are happening to us that feel so big, which they do, they do for me as well. It allows us to get that moment of perspective and go, oh, okay, I think everything's gonna be fine. I think everything's gonna be okay. Allie, anything that's helped you get through the, the last number of months here in 2020? Those are great points. I think just to kind of add on, um, 
is, I mean, I, I spoke on it earlier, but, but making it a consistent practice, I think with everything, whatever you find that works, um, the perspective, I, I think that's an awesome way to, um, to look at things. Um, mm -hmm. but again, you have to practice it. I think so often we, we try things out and then fall back on, um, what we're trying to practice. So just whatever you find, just consistently stick to something and practice it. Fantastic. And last one, just for Dr. Youssef, do your biological uh, chronotypes change over time? Ooh, good question. They do not, in fact. Uh, <laughs> they are genetically determined. Uh, and so you were born with a certain chronotype. However, in general, as we get older, so I'll, I'll say briefly, during the teenage years, most human beings are shifted towards the PM which you'll notice for any you know, college athlete, you're gonna be staying up late, you're gonna wanna sleep in. It's a natural thing and then you'll, it'll reverse um, usually later on in life. Into our senior years, we, we see that we're sleeping less hours in general mm -hmm. and the hours that we do sleep are going to be shifted more towards the AM. Having said that, um, at a more micro scale, your genetic uh, chronotype does not in fact shift. So even with, you'll notice you know, a couple hours difference here and there. If you would like to shift yours, for example, I've noticed most students want to be more AM shifted if they do happen to be PM shifted or biphasic. There are small adjustments you can do like with light therapy and temperature therapy to shift it by a maximum of two to three hours at most. Wow. Awesome, fantastic. Well, unfortunately that, that wraps the time that we have for this wonderful panel on mental health mattering and you mattering, but it's so great to see you all, Dr. Youssef, so great to see you finally. So Dr. Youssef, Dr. Lancaster, Ali Carta, Olympian, thank you all for your time today. And thank you for responding to these questions. Thanks for being a part of amplifying our voices for change.